this, uh, we're now at the Allen Institute, used to be at Caltech, and so this is about, does it not go away? I don't know. Uh, about the emergence of slow switching assemblies in structured neural networks. So this is a very long title, and uh, now what are these things, slow switching assemblies? So, okay, well, happy and cell assemblies are these uh, idea that Donald Happ came up with in the, in the 50s, and basically he thought about how does the brain encode information, and so this is done by groups of neurons, so-called cell assemblies, right? And the interesting thing is, so, so this is from a, a paper for, by Buzaki from 2010, but this is sort of like a reproduce, uh, reproducing a, a figure that Happ drew, and it's like from the 1950s, right? And these uh, numbers here are supposed to indicate times, and the errors are, of course, like network kind of connection, right? And so it's kind of interesting to see that, the, you know, like temporal networks, people talking about this here, uh, this conference quite a lot, but, you know, in the 50s, uh, well, we had it all already somehow, right? But then, of course, uh, um, nowadays, people can record from way more neurons, so back in the day, uh, it was basically impossible to record these type of uh, assembly activities, right? And nowadays, uh, well, basically, people got more and more interested in this. So, uh, as Emma said, uh, I was visiting uh, some, some neuroscience colleagues of mine, and uh, that was during the time where this uh, paper by Lipton and Kumar came out, and what they studied uh, was leaky integrated fire networks, and uh, they were interested, so they were like balanced uh, leaky integrated fire networks, and they found that if they change a few number of connections, so if they make the network sort of more clustered, then what they would get is this kind of cell assembly-like activity. And so uh, I, come, I come more from sort of a, like a network uh, background, like math networks, and uh, when I saw this, I thought, huh, this is interesting. This sort of reminds me of a, a lot of things that I've seen sort of in the network science literature. And in particular, the interesting thing there was also they were like, two time scales here, right? So there's a, there's a slow time scale, that is the switching of the, of the assemblies, so you get you know, no activity, and then the group activates, and then there's no activity, and it seems to be sort of stochastically switching between these two regimes, and then of course there's the fast firing of the neuron. All right, so then I thought, okay, you know, uh, looks a bit like dense clusters, looks a bit like communities, but, uh, <coughs> so this is basically the main question I'm sort of interested in in general. So how does the network structure now shape this dynamics? Or can we say anything about it, right? And uh, so, you know, I've indicated already, uh, we thought maybe, okay, maybe we can do something by studying this network structure and we can say something about this dynamics. Right? So we took the most simple, you know, possible thing that you could think of. We first wanted to understand this from sort of like a rate-based perspective, and uh, we didn't even look into a full network, but you know, like, like we pruned it even more further down. So we just said, okay, um, you know, if you had uh, a network, you would have just positive connections, but in, in neural networks, it's of course very important that you have inhibition as well, right? So some of the classical network theory tools don't really apply, so we said, okay, let's uh, take a step back here, let's just look at this sort of uh, very, very much simplified uh, stylized rate model. So basically, we thought about, okay, we have two populations here, and these two populations are excited to neurons, and they have a strong self-coupling. This is sort of the, the, the equivalent of having a cluster, right? So lots of connections internally. And then we have an inhibitory population of neurons that sort of keeps everything in check. So the idea is that you have like a synaptic coupling matrix, W, like this, where uh, S indicates strong connections, right, it's on the diagonal, so that means these populations excite themselves uh, strong. There is some cross-coupling, and this sort of epsilon parameter here is supposed to be, of course, smaller than the strong X, right? And now this should be sort of balanced networks, so in other words, inhibition and excitation in each of these groups should be roughly balanced. So this is what uh, is commonly done in sort of this leaking integrated fire, uh, networks, and uh, I mean here this is, this is not there yet, right? But the interesting thing here is actually what you get is the separation of timescales, right? And in particular, the, differences, the difference between the strong coupling and this epsilon coupling will give you 
what's sort of called like a, a slow uh, mode, right? And um, so this is a very simplified case, right? You can do a bit more math, uh, and uh, then the spectrum of this network, right? So you should you should think of this. This is this. These are the slow modes. This is basically you know uh, homeostasis. Nothing nothing much happens, and this means that the network is overall stable, right? And so now if you go to a, a large population, so you can use tools from random matrix theory or matrix perturbation theory, right? Then you actually uh, see that instead of having this one mode, you get sort of like a bunch of, of what we sort of call cluster modes. You get this bulk of eigen uh, values here. And in particular, again, you have this spectral gap. Okay. And so the spectral gap, we thought, okay, this is interesting. Let's see if indeed the spectral gap is correlated with this uh, emergence of slow activity. And uh, just sort of to, to briefly mention, indeed these modes, so the only one that I want to focus on is this slow one, is a switching mode. So it drives one population down and the other one up. Okay, so, uh, well, surprise, surprise, we actually found that, uh, you know, as we crank up this clustering parameter, we get not only, so this S hat is a measure of how much we see this uh, um, cluster behavior, and the delta lambda is the, uh, the spectral gap. So there's a nonlinear relation, but basically it tells you like as you have, as soon as you have spectral gap, you can kind of see these patterns. And actually, we did this. So the analysis done on this rate models, but the simulations we did this basically on leaky integrated fire uh, networks, and so they are of course nonlinear uh, entities, and so we were not quite expecting for this to to work that well, but it turns out, so in this case, you can sort of see, right, if I take the, the dominant uh, invariant subspace here from this uh, weight matrix, and then I then take my observed dynamics, I do a, a principal component analysis, so that means I, I look at the dominant spiking patterns, if you wish, and then you compute what's called the, the subspace angle. So you, you should think about this really as, as an angle between two vectors, and instead of a, a two vectors, you look at an angle between two spaces. And the spaces is sort of the, the firing pattern space, right? And as, as this parameter goes up, you can see actually the cosine goes to one roughly, and that means they are very much aligned. They explain this thing very well. Right, so why is this useful? Just to give you like a taste of so now that we sort of understand that the invariant subspaces are related to these patterns, right? We can actually come up with different architectures that are not clustered. So in particular, we can do something like with feedback loops, and I don't have much time to go into this, but the nice thing here is now we can create groups where the inhibitor neurons and the excitatory neurons are sort of working as a team. They, they fire in synchrony. You can do things like small web networks, and the same kind of idea applies. Now these subspaces are actually not you know, tight. Uh, they are sort of more overlapping, if you wish, and you can sort of see that here is like more like a fuzzy boundary. You might even think of this as sort of like overlapping groups. Um, you can do the same thing hierarchically, and uh, maybe you can sort of see in here that you have, uh, you have sort of one time scale, and then within uh, each group you have a, a second one. And yeah, you can, you can do also plenty of more math, but I won't have time to go into this here. So just to say, so this invariant subspace analysis, the spectral properties actually reveal a lot about these emerging fire patterns. I should say there is uh, not much in terms of the timing that you can say. So it's this, the pattern of the firing that you can predict relatively well, but the timing of it is a, is a different issue. That is sort of linear invariant subspace analysis doesn't give you as much. Uh, what's nice about this is also that you can sort of see, if you see these patterns now, they're causing, right? Uh, maybe in the beginning, if you read sort of Lippmann's Fumano paper, you would say, oh, there must be clusters here. Let's look for clusters. No, actually, a lot of different architectures can give rise to similar fire patterns. So, so seeing these fire patterns in, in a dynamical recording doesn't really mean that they have to be densely connected clusters. In particular, I like this sort of feedback structure, which I didn't really mention, but in there is actually the absence of connections that makes this happen. It's kind of interesting. Um, so I want to thank my collaborators. This is uh, joint work done uh, uh, with Yasan Bile and Kostas uh, Anastasio. They uh, were working for and with uh, Christoph Koch and uh, my, my previous uh, PhD advisor, Marisa Barahuna, who's at Imperial College. 
And if you want to know more, I mean, I suggest just have a chat with me at the coffee break, but you can also read these two papers. Thank you.